With great data comes even greater access latency. Welcome to the Trino Community Broadcast, where we transform your latency woes to fast insights. I am your host, Brian Olson. Oh no, Manfred, I can't hear you. <laughs> you should be able to hear me now. I can hear you, yeah. But there's an echo. Hmm. Seems like we have some technical issues. <laughs> Let's see. Um, how about we... Do you have... No. Do you have uh, the sh the show playing on your side? No, I think we're good. You're you're good on your end. Yeah, it was running in the background tab for some weird reason. <laughs> okay, so how about we try this again? Uh, I am your host, Brian Olson. <laughs> I'm Manfred Moser. And that is the joy of being live and doing things live. And heck, right. not even changing it in post production. I'm just going to commit to it. <laughs> so. Uh, Trino Community Broadcast is a show where we cover events and happenings within the open source Trino community and show off some cool stuff about Trino. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, last time we were here, uh, we actually sat down with uh, the creators of Trino. We, uh, we discussed the rebrand, uh, a lot of crazy things that's been going on these days. Uh, yeah. um, it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's never boring. I mean, we we always said that before, but I feel like it's just only becoming more and more true every single episode that we do. Yeah, so, it's good. Yeah, definitely. So um, people are really enjoying the episode last time, and it's always great to talk and learn more and how, what's going on in the community. So. Yeah, it, not only in the community, like it just it, I think this time we were actually able to kind of get a much more deeper understanding of kind of the 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 timelines, the story, and. And it kind of makes uh, a lot of why things are the way they are make sense for the community. So I think it was very, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if, if I'd say like just cathartic to, to kind of understand, oh, that's why it's the way, <laughs> you know, or that's why we have to go through this whole whole rename. But now we have this cute bunny. <laughs> and so uh, so this this episode, uh, we're going to be uh, talking mainly about the concept of distributed uh, hash joins, but we're also going to be talking a lot about, uh, you know, kind of how this rebrand uh, is affecting folks. Uh, one of the common questions we're getting now that we've done the rebrand is, you know, how do what's what's the migration entail? What's uh, you know what what all was done in terms of the last release in 351? Which release should I be on? And so uh, I think it's it's all these things that we we're going to be also talking about this episode just to get everybody's head on straight about where they're. Uh, basically where they need to be and, uh, you know, how the upgrade process is going to look like for them. Uh, it's going to, you know, mileage will always vary a little bit, but, uh, but it will in general be, uh, something that, uh, we, we can talk about. But first, before we jump into all that, let's, uh, get a quick, uh, announcement from our, our, uh, our, uh, fa uh, uh by our, uh, funding, <laughs> our funders. I can't literally talk today. Uh, Starburst Day. <laughs> Hi, I'm Justin Borgman, CEO and co-founder of Starburst. I'm excited to announce Starburst Data Nova coming up February 9th and 10th next year. It's our first large-scale virtual event focused on making faster and better decisions using all of your data, no matter where it resides. We're preparing a great content experience for you. I'm most excited about three things. Number one, this event is relevant for all data enthusiasts, from chief data officers through data scientists to data engineers. There is content for everyone. Number two, all technology stacks are welcome. Warehouses, lake houses, and data lakes in the cloud or on premise, you will find great content to help plan the next phase of your data strategy. And number three, Bill Nye, the science guy, is our keynote. And I personally can't wait to hear him talk about preventing the end of the world. We've made it free for all to attend, but we're limited to 5,000 registrations. So keep an eye on our content updates and sign up soon. Thanks. All right, so we are now talking uh, uh, release 351. Uh, Manfred, do you want to uh, jump right into that? Yeah, so that is a huge release in the sense that it includes all the name changes. As such, um, it has a big impact on everyone, but it doesn't have any additional features. So literally, 
uh, when you go from like 350 that we uh, like released uh, earlier this year was the last release that uses the Presto branding, Presto SQL naming and stuff like that. And the 351 is our first step at having a Adreno release. And that had a lot of changes, right? Like, like literally simple dumb changes like well actually the directory structure of the source code changed now yeah it's actually quite a bit nicer or things that affect you as a user like the file names of binaries that you download are changing but then also things that affect you a bit more like um the jdbc driver has a different jdbc url um that affects you as a data consumer when you write your queries so uh, and then of course a more like deeper changes where you need to, as a, as a person that runs the platform, you know, um, make sure that you test this in your upgrades, right? Like the RPM, for example, is a different uh, file name now. And in the RPM packaging system, that means it's considered a new package. So you can't just upgrade. So what you literally have to do is uninstall it and reinstall. But I'll, otherwise, there is no changes as such in there that make it any different like once you have it up and running it's just as awesome even better in fact um and has all the usual high performance and like standard andrew sql support and that kind of stuff so. yeah from what uh david had had kind of described uh, a little bit he kind of alluded to on the last episode is that this this change was primarily focused on getting everything from a client perspective so if you're any any kind of like cli jdbc uh, any any exposed uh, type of classes that are getting renamed here, uh, a- including anything that's that's showing up in, in any of the connectors, like that is going to be addressed in this 351 release to move you to Trino. And you, as long as you're using this from a user perspective, then then that is you, you're basically safe. Once you've updated to 351, there's going to be no more naming issues and uh, and and things like that. Now, I don't know if that's exactly the case. It didn't sound like that was exactly the case if you were using maybe the SPI, but I don't. he didn't say one way or the other. Are, are you aware SPI of... SPI is completely compatible apart from the package name. So literally, yeah. um, you just have to change the, the input statements, nothing else. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't know if it was... I didn't know if there was more, because it, it just sounded like he, he mentioned that, um, he being David, uh, mentioned that there were changes... Uh, that that were made mainly considering the client, and I just didn't know if there were further changes that we're still working on um, that may eventually come down the line that are more internal uh, that maybe doesn't even affect. I don't know. I'm just curious if there's anything else that might affect people that are well, a little more developer. That, that, that are still in consideration, like for example, what are we doing with the old JDBC string? Do we also support that or not? I think mm. there's some considerations around that just to make it easier. But for example, I sent a pull request, like I'm working on a pull request for dBeaver mm-hmm. so that when you like use that as an IDE, you can just type Trino and you'll get your Trino, the right SQL driver and all that kind of stuff. So, um, How's that going, by the way? Did, um, is there any update on that? Because I use dBeaver a lot and I'd be nice. I, I have not a... an update yet. I just got the, uh, like, I just got the improved images. Like they needed images which had a like transparent background. Okay. And I just got them now. So I'm gonna have to upgrade the PR, change a bit of a text there, and then hopefully it gets merged full and it'll be part of the next release for sure. Gotcha. I just got- you can still use it already now. Like all of those client tools that have convenience methods to automatically download the JDBC driver and all that kind of jazz. That that's all nice to have. It's not required. Right? Like nothing stops you from just downloading a JDBC driver from the Trino website and and go ahead and use it. So it's all, um, all good there. Yeah, we just got uh, somebody saying that, that you were a little difficult to hear. So I'm I'm asking if uh, that's better. Nope, seems yeah, like he's my not. Seems pretty good. It seems I as I am using a mic. Yeah. My mic seems to be all good, so. Yeah, I'm seeing signal come through on, uh, on your end. Let's see. Hmm. Just so you see. <laughs> 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 um. Okay. So. Stuff. Correct. This. I'm not sure. It might be on the way to. 
Yeah, I'm seeing. I'm seeing sig- when you talk. I'm seeing signal go through OBS. So uh, let me see. There's a significant difference. Oh, let me let me turn my volume down, and maybe that will. And I'm turning the system. Turning it down and down and down and down and down. Yeah. I think that's Rose actually helping us there. Yep. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, hopefully that that helps out. How are the how are the volumes now? I should have we should have done a recording before this. And That's okay. It's okay. Sounds are more equal now. Okay. All right. Brian, so now I'm just not overpowering you, and and we can actually hear what you're you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, Brian. You know, always <laughs> overtalking me. <laughs> I try. I, I, sometimes I'm just too big of a loud mouth. So you know. Um, okay. So uh, so yeah. So in in summary, it seems like uh, you know anything any client update. So you know if you're starting fresh. Make sure you're starting on 351. I think that, that we can all agree on that. Yes. Totally. Um, if you're on Presto SQL, uh, the, the io.presto SQL namespace, and basically that's anything 350 or, or before, um, then then you're gonna want to uh, uh, then you're gonna want to slowly make that upgrade. Uh, make sure that you're keeping various. Uh, uh, just make sure that you're keeping these uh, changes in, in place. And there is a we do have a. Um, an actual blog. Yeah, there's a, there's a migration blog post that details that more, and we're gonna make that a bit more, in, like we're gonna expand that even more in the documentation to make it in more detail probably. Yeah, you wanna but talk about that a little more? Like some of the main things that we've seen people have struggles with, or is there anything that uh, uh, that, that has been like hard to understand for, for anybody tran- uh, transferring yet? No, I think it, there's nothing really super complex in the process. It just like it, it is a bit onerous because like some of the aspects of it, like having to change over to a different RPM package, basically means you have to take all your config files and treat it like a new deployment, basically, right? So that's a bit uh, more tricky than than a fresh install. But you know, by the time you run a cluster, you know all these things already by heart. So it's pretty simple, really. Got it. Yeah, so I mean, it basically like you were saying last time, when if you're using it from a CLI or JDBC driver, you just a you got to use the right CLI. the The CLI has to be three fifty one if you're moving to Trino, a, a Trino server. Um, we did. I did actually have somebody uh, was working with who was uh, using Presto SQL on EMR, and because EMR now supports Presto SQL open source, but um, they they don't. They have not made the update, uh, or EMR has not been released since since we have rebranded as Trino. So I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do or when they're going to make that that change. But if you are on EMR, uh, you're you're uh, kind of depending on whatever version they have. So I think the last yeah. one they they set out was 3.43, and uh, and so somebody was uh, went to the Trino website, downloaded whatever we had linked in kind of one of our documentation pieces which was 351 by default. Yeah, it's always the latest release. It's al- always the latest release. And so they pulled that in and they're saying, I don't know why I can't, you know, connect to this. And I couldn't think of it either for at the beginning. And then I was like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's the head, it's the header information. Yeah. Like the, the REST API is completely transparently the same as mm-hmm. well, right? Like if you're directly interacting with the REST API and that kind of stuff is it's the same. But the way it's identified in the HTTP headers is changed from Presto to Trino, right? So, yep. and there is there's this client problem, like in the blog post, you see there the client protocol compatibility. You can set that to be identifying itself as Presto, mm-hmm. basically. Continue to do that, and then it'll then it'll be compatible. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe we'll do some more magic around that to make it even more seamless. Yeah. I uh, I also had to go through and update uh, my Docker images. I I always run kind of a local sandbox Trino thing, and uh, and so now when I moved moved it over, I had to make sure that was updated. I haven't messed with the JMX stuff yet. Um, but well, the JMX stuff um, they are all like Java package level uh, metrics, mm-hmm. so that was all changed as well, right? Yeah, the name of them, the values, and how they calculate, and all that kind of jazz is the same. All the same. But where you front them is gonna be the same. Um, if you're just using the web UI or so, nothing changes because it just exposes them in the UI anyway. Yeah. But if you're doing some other JMX monitoring and stuff like that, then you have to dig into that a bit. 
Fair but enough. again, it's just, you know, simple string change. <laughs> Looks all pretty straightforward to me. I mean, uh, is there anything else you wanted to, to cover before we, uh, uh, before we go on to uh, the concept of the week? Yeah, no, go on. I think we should go on. Um, but uh, I do want to urge everyone, like, if you have any sort of, like, problems or run into anything, do reach out to us on Slack. And if you have any suggested improvements or so to make it even easier, we'd love for you to help us out or work with us on making it even easier. Awesome. Okay, so uh, so this week, uh, we're not, we actually skipped doing a PR of the week. Uh, we, we mainly want to kind of, this is more of a bridge episode to finally get us to uh, the mecca of, of, of uh, episodes we've been working ourselves up to, which is the distributed, uh, or sorry, dynamic filtering. Um, and, and so one of these, one of the concepts that you kind of need to understand uh, a little bit before jumping into that, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, is is uh, understanding kind of uh, just joins in general uh, and kind of some of the terminology that's used around joins. Um, dynamic filtering is is uh, is an optimization on on running a join over uh, a hive table uh, and and in particular uh, kind of uh, not even just hive table but just kind of a uh, the hive model table. So it could be an S three or anything else. It doesn't have to be like HDFS hive. Um, but you're, you're basically running, uh, this, this, uh, optimization over this join and a lot of the terminology that's, that's used, uh, to describe, you know, how, how this, this, uh, actually works, um, can, can be a little confusing if you don't have like a very strong database background or it's been a while. So I, I wanted to really make sure that we covered some of the terminology here, uh, and, and build our way up. And so, uh, one, one way I think, uh, it was it was a good way to kind of talk about this was uh, the the most common uh, join algorithm that's that's used uh, in in the Presto uh, query engine is is uh, distributed hash join. So we're going to start off and kind of take a step back first and just talk about some of the terminology, and then kind of work our way up to what exactly is a distributed hash join, and uh, and then you know kind of uh, apply that terminology then to. Uh, uh, describing how how the distributed hash join works. So um, so basically, I'm not this this uh, all this writing here is stuff for you guys to check out on the show notes later. Uh, if you're on the on the podcast, check out check out the uh, show notes that are linked, uh, and uh, you can read into this. I just wanted to give anybody who's kind of coming in just that wants to read over it uh, a chance to check out and check this out. But I will just be talking about it in prose. So when you think about a join. You're, we're, we're usually talking about uh, two, two tables uh, that have a set of rows. And so what uh, the, there's usually going to be a column that, uh, or not usually, there will be a column, at least one column, maybe multiple columns, that you basically want to, uh, to, to go and find what columns, based on some criteria that I'm going to lay out, what are the columns that uh, I want to specify and what are the, the conditions or the, the criteria that I want with those joints to, uh, to basically say, uh, when these conditions are met, you know, uh, make this uh, join, basically uh, to take these, these uh, uh, different rows from these different tables and kind of uh, make them a, uh, a single row. Uh, basically, uh, this is the concept of, of relation in relational databases is that we are saying that based on these, these uh, equi-join cri criteria that, uh, you know, there are uh, these joins like are significant to one another in the query that I'm asking. So, um, so when you think about how does this actually get implemented, um, the easiest way to, to think about it is uh, to start off with is a, is a nested loop. So in a nested loop, you'll have uh, kind of Two, two things that you're trying to join, and you have to loop over both of these, uh, both of these things. So uh, when I say things, tables. So uh, one way we can simplify this is if we just think about a, a two tables that literally just have a single column. Uh, this, would, this can be in Java represented as an array. So we just have this little array of integers called outer table. And I just have it uh, from two to twelve uh, by even numbers, and then in the inner table, I just have one, two, three, four. And so we can loop through this outer table and inner table by doing this nested join, and uh, and basically what we're going to do is print out the uh, the um, the the combination of these two values at any given time. So 
Well, what we first are going to do is anything, anytime we have a value for the outer table, we're going to have the pair be the first value of the outer table plus all of the pairs of the inner table. And each one is going to be a, a, a explicit value. And this is going to output what we call a Cartesian product. Um, so uh, this is uh, basically just a fancy way to say, um, you know, I want every single possible permutation of, of the sets uh, of, of both of these tables. So if I have two in the outer table, this is the first value, then I want to have a, uh, uh, I want to have different uh, values that sp spit out two, one, two, 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 three, two, four. And then for the next value, I want four, one, four, two, and so on and so forth. And so that's going to give us our Cartesian pro product. In fact, if we look at down here, we see that that, uh, that ends up being the output of this, this nested loop here, as we see every, for every single value of the outer table, we see uh, a, an equivalent of the, of the inner table. So uh, for, for each of those outer, outer table values. Um, and so that would be just the most simplest basic join that you can have. Uh, I, I talk a little bit about the relational algebra. Sometimes you'll see this represented as relational algebra. And the uh, basic idea is that you would have some uh, va value that would say, you know, like, uh, let's say O for outer and then I for inner. And then you're going to, the Cartesian product would be represented by a multiplication sign. You'll see that uh, type of um, no, uh, notation, as well as you might also see this uh, be represented in a tree format. So there may be some operator. You could either see this listed out as Cartesian product, or you could say uh, that, that there's actually like an X there, uh, which is that, that symbol uh, in relational algebra. And then it's just pointing down to the outer and the inner. Now, another uh, bit of notation, and I have this note down here, is when we're, when we're looking at uh, something in, in relational algebra or when we're looking at uh, something in a, in a tree diagram like this, uh, you will always see the outer join. So if you're thinking about these as a nested loop, uh, you'll always see the outer join be, be displayed on the left side of, of, the, um, of, of the join itself. And uh, there are particular reasons for this that aren't going to be very clear whenever we're just looking at this as a nested loop, but uh, but I'll we'll get to that here in the in the next iterations of of uh, of these uh, how we're going to optimize this loop here in a minute. So so we have uh, the outer on the left, inner on the right, and so if you think about that, that's this outer loop here is going to go on the left, inner loop here is going to go on the right, and just. As long as you remember that, whenever you're looking at one of these kind of query plan diagrams, that's that's just something that that you can kind of think of. Okay, this is if I were to actually transform this diagram or this relational algebra into code, you would make sure that left side is always being put on the outer loop, not the inner loop, uh, because in theory, you know, you could get, especially when you're talking about the Cartesian product, you can get the exact same answer whether you're you're putting the inner table here on the outer table and the outer table on the inner table. You could flip those around and you're going to get the same, maybe not, uh, you would have to switch up how you're printing this out to get the exact same output, but you're going to be, you're going to uh, get the same permutations. The total number of permutations is the same. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so that being said, that is the most basic kind of like ground floor uh, uh, type of uh, join that you, you can do. And that's what you do whenever you put like, uh, you'll see in SQL notation, I didn't put this up on the notes, but in SQL notation, when you put like a comma um, or you say cross join, that is the type of join that, uh, that will generally be uh, uh, com uh, comp computed, <laughs> that will be com computed. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so yeah, so that will, uh, that, that is basically the, um, the most, most basic one you'll ever have. The next type of join that we'll talk about uh, is uh, basically called like a natural join or another a simpler, uh, more generic version of it is called equijoin. But, uh, but I'm specifically, just for the sake of uh, example, I'm just going to uh, talk about the natural join where you will basically have uh, the same, you know, so in, in two tables, if you have uh, columns that are named the same, so let's say you know you you have ID column in one uh, table, which is the let's say the outer table has an ID column and the inner table has an ID column. Then uh, 
and then let's say there are like uh, columns A, B, C in column in the first table, and there's columns D, E in the second table, then it's going to notice that there's an, uh, a, a matching ID column, and the database is going to, and the end query engine, I should say, is, uh, is going to be smart enough to say, oh, okay, if there's this ID column, and then uh, and they're asking for basically what's called this natural join, I am basically going to uh, do where this column equals this column, and that way, it's kind of a shorthand to, to basically say something along the lines of where uh, O equals uh, um, basically where, where uh, the ID column of O equals the ID column of I uh, or, or outer, if, 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 uh, an inner, if you will. So, so natural join is uh, one way of doing it. If you have like more specific criteria, or if you have, uh, you know, maybe you don't want to join on certain uh, t uh, columns. So in our previous example, I had said, you know, the outer table has uh, columns A, B, C. Let's say that the inner table also had columns A, B, C, and you don't want to join on those. You only want to join on the ID. In that case, you can't use a natural join because natural join is going to basically be very simplistic and say, this column exists on this table, this column exists on this table, so I'm going to use all of these columns to, to make sure that they're all equal. So, uh, so you have to be careful when you're using a natural join and make sure that that's actually what you, desire, that what you want uh, out of it. And so sometimes it's even more clear to specify an equijoin and say, hey, here are all the actual uh, you know, join criteria that happen here. Were you going to yeah, say something, I mean, Matthew? This specifically, when you, write a, when you write a SQL query, you, you tell in the query what joins on, right? Yeah, that's that's typically much more clear. If you do, I, I don't, I, I'm actually not sure. I, I, I've never used natural join uh, uh, syntax in, um, uh, and I'm not sure if it's actually part of the ANSI SQL syntax or not. Uh, that might just be an extra thing that exists in some databases and not all. Yeah, I think you just have to say what the join is on. Yeah, for natural- to like to like, sort of like um, as an example, right, say, like the key would be something like you have a trend, you have a whole bunch of like transactions for a specific a, a customer or so. Mm -hmm. The customer key, it, it's often called also the key. Mm -hmm. Like you have one customer record that is like that person. Yeah. And then all the transaction related to that person or that account, that same identifier shows up in all the transactions. And that's that, that's that key that identifier that's the same. It's yeah. Yeah, totally. And like, but if you did have like, if you were joining that, let's say that transaction table with another table that had the uh, a um, a column called key, you could just do a natural join and not have to specify the actual thing. So that's it's a it's a small it's basically a very specific version of an equi join, and it's mm -hmm. just trying to simplify some of the syntax for you. So I it's 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 actually a totally tangential thing. So, uh, but if you want to, you can check out natural join. I think I, I don't know if even Trino supports it, but I I do I do know that uh, um, you know like things like MySQL and stuff uh, do support this particular syntax. But I, I use it because the the nomenclature in relational algebra is also much uh, simpler. You can just specify this without spe uh, uh, saying it, but then I also then ended up doing this anyway. So I probably just made our lives more complex and uh, <laughs> uh, when 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 uh, for this discussion. But uh, what this is basically saying is we're performing a join, and we only want to uh, have a join where these this outer table column. Uh, let's say this column is the ID column, as well as this inner table column is the ID column. So we only want to basically uh, return uh, the rows where these values are, are equ uh, equal. So in that case, you know, it's simple enough to basically just add an if statement uh, right underneath the, the nested for loop and say, okay, anytime uh, O is equal to I, which is, you know, O would be one of the rows in the outer table and I would be one of the rows in the inner table. Anytime those are equal, then that's when we actually emit and say that this, this uh, row is uh, qualifying based on the join criteria. So, uh, of course, once we, we add this uh, 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 particular criteria, we only get two rows, and that is the times that two and two uh, gets returned, as well as four and four. And so, uh, so that is, uh, you know, basically how you, you could see something like uh, these criteria for um, uh, these criteria for these uh, uh, natural joins or equijoins happen is that, um, is that they will um, 
uh, they will basically apply the criteria and make sure that only the rows that meet those criteria uh, are actually emitted. So, um, so it seems like this is fine. Like this is doing everything we wanted to do. But one thing that we're really not, we're kind of, we kind of miss out in these little simple nested loop loop examples uh, is that uh, these tables in a real database uh, scenario, you'll actually end up uh, having to read data, the, read all of these values here uh, out of a uh, out of a file or a database um, saved on your disk, and disk uh, latency. Uh, I, I looked up one uh, a study basically from two thousand nine, so this could be a slight bit outdated, but. When you look at kind of random disk access compared to uh, random memory access, uh, you are dealing with uh, 316 values per second for random disk, 36.7 million values per second for random memory uh, uh, access. And so uh, it's uh, a factor of 100,000 that uh, basically you will, will be increasing the speed when you're, when you're reading these values um, from disk versus when you're reading it from memory. And so uh, it's really important, and one of the probably major st areas of study for anybody who does uh, uh, look into databases or, or researches databases is how to kind of uh, make these trade-offs of keeping things in memory as much as possible that are relevant to you at that time, uh, and then trying to minimize the amount of times that you have to go out to disk. And so, uh, and so this is, uh, you know, of course, uh, something that's very important to, um, to any, anybody, including uh, us here in, on, on the Trino team, uh, to kind of uh, optimize for. So, so then we, we look at how maybe there's a way that when we do these joins, uh, we don't necessarily have to do this nested loop. Because if you look at the complexity for, for any of these nested loops, you're, you're, uh, when you're talking algorithmic complexity, you, you uh, are looking at a O n squared, big O n squared, which means that anything on the outside has to, uh, basically anything on the inside has to happen uh, every single time something happens on the outside. So basically for every value here, let's, you know, th these are uh, five or f five or uh, six values on the outer table, you know, what if this ends up going to, uh, you know, billions and billions of, of values that we have to read out? And they're not just single, you know, columns. They're actually these giant uh, rows that have like, you know, 600 columns, you know, per row. So it's like when you start scaling it up to that, that uh, 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 level of magnitude and you start pulling out levels of like kind of big data uh, t type uh, things that we're, we're uh, analyzing on the Trino side, then you start running into these issues of, okay, like it's really, really, really much more expensive to go to disk than to, uh, to, to actually pull these values from disk than to have it in memory. So a uh, common way to handle this nested loop uh, issue is you actually read in the entire inner table before you actually even start talking to the outer table. So that's actually what we can do here. Uh, and, and what they... Well, here before I hop into that thing, let's let's stay let's stay into the natural the, this this loop uh, thing here. So what we want to do is we want to actually read in just one time everything from disk into memory, so that it's much it's you, we're not having this factor of a hundred thousand uh, uh, seconds longer for every single bit value that we're trying to pull in because that just gets exponentially huge. Um, over and, and it just makes things way, way slower when it comes to actually returning uh, uh, a, a join in, in any, any good time. So we, uh, we now can uh, basically say to this table that we're going to first uh, pull into memory, we can call that the build table because what we're going to do is we're going to build that, uh, that table in memory. So, uh, so that is the uh, terminology for, uh, for this inner table. And then the outer table, we're going to call a probe table. We don't necessarily want to read uh, everything. Since the outer table is basically, we're going to loop over it anyways, we can uh, just hold the, the inner table or the build table in memory. And then the outer table, we can just stream it across because there's no real use to actually bringing both tables into memory because you're just basically just... Uh, filling up your memory at that point. You only need one of them in there 
to actually do this nested loop, but then you, you're not having to do that disk access every time on the inner table. Um, I'm, it, is there any better way I can explain that, Manfred? I don't know if it's if it's like if I'm being too convoluted or if I should just move on to the real example of this. No, no, I think that's good. Uh, just uh, for practical purpose, uh, I want to just like uh, give a little bit of light on the practical uh, implication. What that means, and it comes up now and then, is the idea that you load one table completely into memory to process it is extremely important. Um, and the implication for that practically is that your nodes, like your workers in the cluster, should have enough memory to be able to do that. Yep. So that's a real, a real, real question and concern. And that's why you typically want to have larger nodes in Trino so that you can do that optimization, as we'll see in a sec when uh, Brian dives into that. It, has, it makes a big, big difference. So by having bigger nodes that can load bigger tables of this like reference lookup data or so, you can get tremendous performance improvements out of just being able to load the data. And that's why you want bigger nodes. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and this is why, you know, when you see queries start to to fail and things like that, it's usually, you know, it's 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 just we there's not a, we're we're trying to basically load all this this these tables into memory uh, and keep keep everything alive and uh, and you've basically gone over your quota or or you've gone over uh, what what we can actually support on these individual nodes, so we're just going to have to kill your query, unfortunately, kind of thing. Um, so, so that's why it's an, it is important to uh, y y getting back to some of the stuff that Dane talks about in, in the uh, uh, in the video uh, talking about query or uh, sorry cluster tuning and things like that. Um, that's that's super important to make sure that you you consider how much load and how much uh, memory is going to be basically how much of these tables are going to be pulled into memory uh, at a given time. So, um, so moving on, let's now, now that we are kind of armed with this, uh, this build and probe terminology. So again, the build table is the one that is the, is on the inside loop. Originally, we want to basically pull that out and build that table up, uh, in memory first. And then we're going to actually go, uh, stream the probe values, uh, and basically, uh, d use them to, to give us the values that we want. So, Here's the loop now. We you notice now that there are two for loops, but they're not nested within each other. So that is actually the key to, to making this uh, this join um, uh, much 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 faster when we're dealing with this big amount of data on on disk, and we don't want to have to take pay that penalty to actually read all that data off disk. So we're gonna have uh, this this uh, hash table, which in Java is a you know can be represented as a map. Um, and so uh, in this, in the, it's a little difficult to maybe understand with this uh, concept, but you, you could think of the hash table, it's, uh, it's mapping, it's, it's a map of integer to integer, but this integer could also be a row. So it could be an integer, meaning the, the hash value, uh, and then it could be, or, or it could be, the hash value could even be a string. Um, and then the, on the value side of this map uh, in, in Java, could be actually some row object that has you know unlimited number of columns and things like that. But for our case, uh, you know we we're talking about these tables that which are just integer arrays that uh, only have a single column here. So it's just basically a map that goes from the hash, which is the the integer column, and it's also the entire row value as well. So it's going to be a little silly, but I uh, I use this. Uh, uh, kind of term, this terminology or this naming here, where we're actually going to rename, you know, any of the individual value, row values to the hash itself. So that way, when you actually build this table, you're actually putting one value, even though it's the same value, uh, one value that is the hash as the uh, basically the key of that uh, hash table, and then the row is actually going to be uh, the the value that comes back from that, and that could be generalized to multiple multiple rows in a or multiple columns in a row. So here's the for loop that builds this. And now once we're past this for loop, now we have built in this, uh, this build table in memory. And now we're gonna actually go across the probe table and pull out the, uh, the hash values and basically say, okay, anytime where the, uh, the hash value um, actually returns a, a, um, the build tables row uh, from, this, from this hash, 
then uh, and it's basically not returning a null, then we're gonna uh, emit that uh, that as a build row plus the row, and we're gonna get the same you know uh, output that we had before, or it's gonna be two two four four um, that that get output from that because the values are equal, right? So uh, so nothing's really changed in terms of uh, the the query plan or anything like that, other than that we're calling it the the tables now instead of inner and outer, we're gonna call them you know the left side, the outer what was originally the outer table is now still on the left called probe. And the build side, uh, uh, the build table is now on the right side and that is uh, that one is originally the inner table. And so, um, so you know, relational algebra and this tree doesn't really change too much. But what does change when we implement this this way is we've now dropped from a n o n squared runtime to now uh, a linear runtime. So basically, we only pull in the the values, these values of the um, of the uh, 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 database, or basically from this data from the storage. We only have to address, like pull that in and scan that one time instead of having to scan that storage space every single time. It's it uh, we we go across a value in the probe table. So that's really the whole point of having a build and probe table and why it's so fundamental to to even not even hash joins. You know, we're we're getting there in a little bit, but uh, but even when you're when you're looking at uh, kind of uh, when I, I meant to say distributed hash joins, which is what we do in Trino. Um, but it, this hash joins are, are much more valuable um, whenever you're looking at trying to optimize uh, just just any any database in general. This could be in MySQL and uh, and and other other things. Whenever you are basically lacking uh, the ability to have the data in a sequential order, um, which would be something more like a B tree, uh, and you can only do that with one column, right? So, uh, um, so yeah, anytime you're lacking that capability, you can also use a hash join in any, any of these databases. This is not anything that's like Trino specific. Um, in fact, it's very, very common to a lot of databases. Um, one slightly tangential point uh, to be made here now, and, and I'm not going to go into the depths of this, but I wanted to show this image just so that, uh, you know, it kind of really uh, puts the, um, the, the thought in your, in your mind of, of how this extends out into database theory in general. Um, when you, there are these concept of left deep and right deep uh, query plans. And so you can see uh, that based on the orderings of these joins and based on uh, how the probe and build will, will basically happen, uh, it will affect the way that your query gets ran. So this is a bit tangential to the actual point of the distributed hash join, but I wanted to point this out and I have a link to um, uh, a, a cool little article that kind of talks about this. Uh, the implications of doing a left deep uh, plan versus a right deep plan. And uh, you can kind of imagine a little bit uh, based on what we just talked about in terms of uh, complexity and things like that, that, uh, you know, which, which ones will, will do better in certain scenarios. But we're not here to talk about that today. Let's get to the final uh, talk that I, I had promised you, which is uh, talking about uh, hash joins and distributed hash joins and how basically Trino uh, basically uh, uh, runs these. So um, so this is an image from uh, a, a Java Helps uh, as a, one of, somebody who is kind of uh, in our uh, Trino community um, uh, wrote this up and talks about uh, hash joins a little bit. I really like this image. Uh, it kind of uh, really showcases uh, uh, the in memory. So if you see this box, this is you know uh, me meant to talk about uh, memory, and you see some data source. And basically, first you do the build table stores that uh, information in memory on some sort of key, and then as you're probing the table, you're kind of having it, he's showing this kind of as a, like kind of a streaming set of values that are coming by memory, and then uh, you know if you wanted to really be uh, full full proof on this, you would show these values also kind of going away and getting thrown out if they don't uh, if they don't. Uh, um, uh, actually uh, meet the criteria. So, um, so basically uh, the, uh, the final thing I wanted to uh, point out is how Trino actually uses this, um, this, this uh, hash join. So um, the big difference is that uh, we do it distributed. <laughs> um, and we have different levels of, uh, we have different levels of parallelism here. Um, so first uh, level, um, Actually, uh, Manfred, I have to go put my dog away. Can you can you stall for just one second? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So 
the other aspect, like what what you always have to remember when you like look at probe versus build, is the the the, the simple thing to think about is the build is always the what's often called like the lookup table or so. So it's basically like the reference data, the non-transactional data that's used from a practical perspective. And um, it's important to have that in your query on the right side so that uh, Trino can understand which one to put into memory. Because if, if it's in the wrong one, like if it tries to put the transactional table into the memory on all the nodes, then it's gonna run out to into problems with the memory much faster than if it's just a lookup table of, you know, like a couple of cities or, or countries or whatever, right? <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, dog, dog was starting to go a little crazy and I didn't want that to uh, uh, basically affect the, the, the uh, stream. So, okay. Yeah, me, me and Tabani were looking after things, so don't worry. Awesome, good to know. So what I was trying to get to here is that um, we, we will, uh, the big, gain that we get from this is that we can now we now have uh, this algorithm that is called a hash join. But uh, one great part about uh, hash joins is that uh, with the with the hashing itself with basically, you know, you could you could imagine it as either an integer value, but uh, hashes can actually be as, as we know, kind of much more complex than that. Uh, they they will help you in kind of ways that uh, if you want to uh, basically imagine each of these values uh, that, that gets uh, uh, ultimately uh, put into a, what we could think of as like a partition. Um, we, we want these values to um, ultimately wind up uh, somewhere and they don't have to be on uh, every single node. So uh, looking at uh, different workers. So let's say you have uh, workers that are spread across your, uh, your, pres your tr Presto, Trino cluster. Uh, and, uh, and you want to uh, basically divide that work up, you can now uh, use that, that uh, value that was uh, hashed um, to basically divvy up the work. You can specify different buckets and, uh, and it's very well known to basically say, take this hash value or these, this, this set of hash values. So in this example, we could say this, this uh, you know, string www.javahelps.com, maybe they're uh, hashing on, on the URL or something. Um, so you can actually use that as a hash value and anything that is, you know, www.javahelps.com will go to worker one, anything that is trino.io that goes to worker two and so on and so forth. And now this actually becomes a very good, uh, uh, uh set, uh, I guess, framework for us to start pushing these individual, uh, set of values that are going to be needed for the joins. Now this can be easily distributed across the, the, uh, workers, uh, in particular the Presto workers. And so this will, Presto will now know, uh, Presto, man, I got to get that out of my head. Trino will now, uh, move these, um, uh, these, these, uh, rows that are going to be meeting a particular join criteria to that, uh, individual worker. And so, um, so what uh, basically needs to happen is uh, uh, once the the data has, or once the rows have all arrived for one particular um, for one particular uh, uh, hash, you can then start taking the uh, next set of values uh, and and go to another level of parallelism. And so, the next level would be that within the worker, you actually are going to uh, uh, spread out different. So worker one might actually have javahelps.com. It may have java.com and it may have a couple, you know, various other, uh, uh, hash values that get mapped to it. So it then has the responsibility to, uh, deal with these, uh, different values and map them to a particular thread. So it can also then process these, uh, within these different threads as it's, um, uh, as it basically, uh, gets these different values. So thread one will be assigned a particular hash. Thread two will get assigned, assigned the next uh, value hash and so on and so forth. So each thread in this worker is now assigned to uh, that hash value. And when we actually go to uh, stream the probe side, uh, the probe side can now be done in kind of a, a, bulk, uh, a bulk method. So it, you'll send the probe uh, to uh, basically uh, take these uh, set of values. Let's say we make the bulk size, uh, the batch size, uh, 
like a 50 or something like that. So every 50 values that we get uh, on the probe side that match the criteria for, uh, for worker J and thread one, then that uh, particular worker then gets that batch uh, from the probe side, and then it will now distribute that batch in, in uh, mass and basically quickly be able to process the, the join that occurs on uh, for all of the uh, existing values in memory uh, from the build side, as well as the big batch that we just got from the probe side. Is that making sense? Yep, yep. So the difference between, and, and I like to think about these two different levels of parallelism. There's a visual that I have uh, uh, here that kind of separates a, a little bit of extra ter presto terminology, but uh, but in, in our context, you know, when you're looking at the, um, the uh, workers being distributed across, that one is called internode parallelism. Uh, and then whenever you're looking at within a specific worker, the level of parallelism that happens across threads, that's looked as intranode parallelism. And so the whole way across this, you can keep using these hash values to, to basically keep s spreading out this work, not only at the worker level, but also at the, uh, within the node level itself. And so, uh, as, and this makes things very optimal whenever you're uh, trying to batch things and do things uh, uh, when, you're, when you're pulling the uh, probe, probe values over and you're not trying to, you're trying to basically minimize the number of, uh, of network communications that are going on during these operations. So that was a handful, but that is uh, in a nutshell, kind of how these hash, hash uh, tables work, uh, or sorry, distributed hash joins work. And uh, in particular, when you're looking on the blogs, we have a couple of blogs that are going to kind of allude to like dynamic filtering and, and push downs and things like that. And when they talk about these, uh, uh, these types of, you know, basically when we're talking about joins, this terminology is used frequently. And so it's very, very good to kind of have this repertoire of, of, uh, of uh, terminology and understanding of how these algorithms work just at even at a surface level so that when you're kind of running these tuning operations, you kind of get a feel for, okay, at a, at a task level, this is kind of the, the things that I'll be changing. And then at an operator level, these are the kind of things that I'll be changing uh, whenever I, d I dive into, you know, kind of uh, the uh, intranode versus internode type uh, parallelism. So, um, so that is the concept of the week. Um, Manfred, did you have anything, any comments, final comments that you wanted to say about uh, distributed hash joins? Yeah, uh, one thing that I want to like, <laughs> again, I'm gonna go back down to the practical thing, what that means. So uh, just um, keep in mind, the coordinator has to orchestrate all that where the different uh, hashes are on which workers. Mm -hmm. um, the transport between uh, and the talk, talking between the workers uh, and the coordinator is all via HDB. Mm -hmm. Uh, each worker runs a large, big JVM that maxes out the memory available to it. And then in that Java virtual machine, the different threads in that worker, they just like oh, collaborate in like um, across threads. So that's again, a different level of performance, right? So um, it's much faster obviously to operate within the JVM and there's one large JVM running, not multiple on each worker. There's one very large one and all the, the parallelization happens within the one JVM across threads. Mm -hmm. So it's like a nested parallelization in a way. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and that's that along with like all the optimizations that are done in like the JVM is really like the, the, the secret sauce to, to Trino's uh, like success and speed and why it's become so popular, so cool. Um, all right. Well, I think that that's, that should be getting us in a good space then for uh, the next episode, which is going to be the finally getting the dynamic filtering. We'll be having uh, Renak and, and Carol uh, join us for that uh, to talk about the, the specifics there. And, and I uh, was showing something that we thought we were going to be able to get closer to. Uh, why don't we just uh, get off the, uh, let me go back to the interview scene. Because we actually are not ready, unfortunately. We we said by this time we were going to have a short list of names. Uh, well, we do have a short list, but not the, the final short list to provide people to vote. We have some really cool names. Like personally, I definitely have a few favorites. Yeah. That I, that, that I like. So. What would be okay? So what's your favorite cur current running favorite right now? Okay, so I have three. Let, let me throw out three favorites. Um, 
the short one is uh, new as like just N U, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, I'm a I have my background is in physics, so that's one of the particles that works well with neutrino as like trino comes from neutrino, so I yep. kind of like that. Yeah, I like um, that too. I'm an avid coffee drinker and Java developer, so I also like espresso. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the third one is nitro that I also find kind of funny. Yeah. Also, yeah. So <clears throat> all of these, and I, I actually brought out one, uh, one more coffee related one, which was cappuccino, but it's, it's too hard to say it's too long. Uh, it's a little cute, but at the same time, yeah, it's just like not, uh, uh, it, I, it doesn't have the, the urgency that espresso has. So yeah. I would say if I had my top three picks, uh, would also be kind of sitting around, uh, Lepi. Uh, is is one that was not on your list. Um, yeah. So this is uh, uh, one that was brought up, uh, and uh, basically it's a constellation uh, that is uh, one of the. It's a it's a bunny uh, constellation, and it sits underneath Orion's uh, feet. So if you're ever if you're, I'm always able to easily see Orion whenever I look for the kind of three stars on his belt. Um, so if you look south of that, uh, south of Orion's belt. Uh, there, you, you should be able to eventually spot uh, uh, Lepus. And then so we could, uh, uh, and Lepus is also a, uh, you know, known to be a very fast bunny because it can run away from Orion and Orion's dogs. Orion is a hunter. So it, it being the hunter that's trying to uh, uh, hunt, hunt the bunny. So, so uh, we're going to have a full on background story for our bunny. Exactly. We can adapt the background that I'm using to actually have the solo thing in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and just have him running away from Orion or something something like that and, and constantly out, outsmarting Orion and, and his dogs. Um, so, so that was one I thought. And so it's for short for Lepis, it would be Lepi. Um, and I thought that was very cute. Uh, I also am a huge fan of new, uh, it's very neutrino centric. Um, Nova was, was, uh, uh another one for me. That's so if I'm not going to choose one of the coffee ones would also be Nova. I thought was very cool because, uh, neutrinos are actually created, uh, uh, during radioactive decays, such as a supernova. So I thought that was pretty neat, uh, kind of, uh, 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 another alignment to the neutrinos, uh, kind of naming there. So a lot of, a lot of things up in the air there. Uh, we're also going to try to, uh, see once we get, uh, this, uh, set up, uh, we will be putting a poll out there for the short list of, of these, like kind of, I would say, you know, I don't know if it's going to be about five or so, uh, we're, we're going to kind of keep culminating and find out who, but, There'll be a smaller list of names to choose from out of the ones that were given to us. Uh, a few honorable mentions I would also like to say was Commander Bun Bun. I like that one. Uh, there was also uh, uh, Quentin uh, Tarantino. Um, and uh, shoot, what was the last? There was another one last really good one, and I can't. Uh, it's, uh, we'll have them in the show notes. And there's a thread yeah. on Slack where people voted and suggested them. So for sure, if you're looking for some funny suggestions, you can definitely check out that thread on Slack. Definitely. So uh, so for the last part, Manfred, uh, do you want to uh, just talk about uh, you had kind of mentioned we, we have a few requests from the community. Yeah, uh, you want to quickly go back to the screen show, share screen yeah. and uh, we'll bring up the website. Um, well, there's two aspects to that. Um, our website, the Trino.io website, has a, a user testimonials section now right on the front page. Um, and we would love for you all to uh, tell us about your Trino usage and get added to that. So go back to the front page and you'll see that Oops. it just shows all the logos. And you can see here each individual logo links to that specific testimonial and it all goes to the users page. Um, we are constantly adding more. There's a lot of uh, organizations we're talking at the moment too. They're just gonna get their snippet of text they wanna have on that website as well. So For sure. um, please uh, reach out to us on Slack and uh, we'll get them added. All we need is a little paragraph your logo and the link we can we can link to your engineering blog or whatever you like to do there. So it uh, would be awesome to make this a big long list. Um, yeah. And I think it is, I think the reality is it's a pretty getting, it's a pretty long list. And I think one, one thing about the rebrand that made this very apparent about how long this list was, was how many people came to us screaming when they were like, wait, what's this mean? <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like uh it's it's kind of funny like a lot of people lurk on on the on the channels and you don't really get too much of a sense of who's actually using it until you rebrand uh and and change the uh uh and basically cause a, a need for for migration to happen so so it was uh it was interesting to see yeah just just uh how many people were were actually uh, using 
um, Trino versus uh, the uh, versus Presto. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of like, I mean, there's a lot of advantages to using Trino. Yep. Um, in terms of performance and more connectors and stuff like that. And that reminds me, actually, go to the blog. There's a very nice blog post that we uh, also published since our last episode that oh, talks yeah. about what we had in happening in 2020. Just by the numbers, some of those things are truly astonishing, like the growth on Slack, um, the number of uh, commits, and then uh, all the changes on the code. Um, so definitely worth checking out um, all the things that happened there that uh, if you're interested to see... Um, where Trino is going also, there's a lot of things going on at the moment uh, that's very exciting. So check out that blog post on Trino.io as well. De definitely. Um, and, last one was you were gonna say, mention about uh, seeing if uh, we can um, do a little request for, for documentation. <laughs> yeah, uh, same, same with the user testimonials. We would love for you to reach out and um, we can help you with that. Myself and my team and uh, all a lot of the other maintainers and committers, we're all working towards improving the documentation and the website more and more, obviously. And um, it is a little bit different now. It used to be a folder called presto-docs where the documentation is. It's even simpler now. It's literally in the code base, just a slash docs directory. And there is uh, a very simple, uh, Docker based build where you just go dot slash build and it will do the build of the documentation. It then just generates static HTML in a target directory. So literally um, it's in the Trino uh, itself, not the Trino.io. Oh, okay. 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 So yeah, not Trino IO. See, I did, I, I was showing that yeah, people so in, might in get that, confused. <laughs> the Trino.io is the website source code where the user testimonials go. If someone wants to send a pull request, that's totally cool as well but we can also just write it for you. And you see here the docs directory is literally just now this build script. It's a, um, and the rest is just a restructured text files. Pretty simple to write. It's kind of like Markdown, it's just a little bit simp different syntax. And if you're struggling with any of that, the readme in that directory also has lots of help on like our Google documentation uh, style guide that we're following for titles and grammar and all those kind of things. So there's a lot of help available. And we're also always on Slack. So um, anyone that works on some code, ideally also think about how you wanna talk about that to your users and reach out to us and we'll help you find the right document to post this in or add a new one, right? Yeah, definitely. Cool. That'll be awesome. All right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that was, uh, our episode today. Uh, is there anything else you needed to cover before we, uh, we hop off Manfred? No, I think we're good. Um, do continue to reach out to us. Um, and we'll work together and make Trino awesome. Awesome. So, uh, yep. Yeah, music for the show, uh, is, is provided by uh, Mega Man six gameplay album by, uh, Christoph Slawikowski. And, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We will see you all in two weeks. All right. See ya.